your mic work. No. Okay. Test. Oh. All right, we actually have a lot of announcements today, and I want my teaching time. So we're going to get started right away with the announcement phase of the class. So a few students emailed some announcements. I guess there's a performance coming up. You guys are so talented. It just blows me away. Look at this. you got the spice it up going on. You all should go to that. Get spiced up. And uh, we also have uh, this, Global Br Brigades. Um, uh, so if you have any more questions, the email is at the bottom. Um, we have a recruitment event coming. So this is becoming the announcement central. So we actually have a very special guest here today, Professor Nick Fawzi, uh, who's in the pharmacology or MPP department. And he wanted to share with you some great news about a new class that he's starting. Thanks, Art. Uh, my name is Nick Fauzi. I'm a new professor here in biology. And I'm starting a class uh, in the fall entitled uh, Biomolecular Interactions, Health, Disease, and Drug Design. And the idea of the class, one of the prerequisites is this class that you're in right now. The class is uh, directed towards mainly seniors uh, as well as a few graduate students. But um, juniors and seniors are welcome to apply. We're going to process the wait list in the fall. But the idea of the class is to, to understand more about the physical interactions that make life possible, what goes wrong in disease, and then how you can use uh, design techniques, both experimental and computer, to solve some of these problems. So we're going to have computational aspects, we're going to have experimental aspects, guest lectures from industry, and as well as other faculty here at Brown. So it should be an exciting uh, seminar class. Thanks very much. All right, so this is actually my favorite lecture of the semester, so I might go a little fast. Um, slow me down with questions. Uh, so here we're sort of bringing a lot of things together, and we're going to start talking about, well, first we have one of my reminders. Uh, Monty Python provides a little not-so-funny comic relief. So there's actually exams coming up. Uh, there's a... Exam three is April 29th, Tuesday. I guess two Tuesdays from today. So something you want to begin thinking about. Uh, the lectures covered on that are 16 through 22. And the final, uh, remember that's a comprehensive final, and that's coming up uh, on Monday, uh, May 12th. And we have a new location that has been awarded to us for the final. Uh, and so we're going to le leave... Sesame Street, Bert, and we're going to go to Metkim. So Metkim is, for the N to Z folks, Metkim is across the street. I guess Bert was already claimed, uh, and so we're going to be in Metkim. And Macmillan, 
uh, for the rest of us. So those who are normally in Macmillan will stay in Macmillan for the final examination. Yes? Uh, Metcam is across the street. Uh, Metcalf, yeah. Yeah, the, the registrar calls it Metcam. I guess at one point it used to be associated with chemistry. And now it's uh, Metcam across the street, yeah. So if you Google Brown Metcam, the first hit, that's where you need to go. All right, so let's move along. So today we're going to be covering translation. Remember we covered uh, transcription last time. Uh, we've made our mRNA molecules, and now we need to convert those RNA molecules into uh, proteins. And so actually one of the world leaders in uh, research uh, into translation is uh, uh, Professor normally, or often teaches in this class, Professor Gerald Yogel. And so he actually solves crystal structures of ribosomes. And these are millions of Dalton's large uh, complexes. And so um, we definitely have sort of a proud tradition at Brown of uh, pioneering research in this field. Okay. And so first, um, we need to think about the genetic code. And so we have to think about, okay, how, we have these four nucleotides, and we've got 20 amino acids. So we've got to translate these two languages. And so we have to think about um, you know, the, the codons, what's actually recognized by the tRNA molecules. Uh, and we also have to think about some of the, uh, the diversity of different types of tRNA molecules and why uh, things have evolved as they have. And then we're going to look, uh, after considering the code, at the actual translation machinery. Um, we all know that it's messenger RNA, tRNAs, ribosomes uh, coming together. And we're going to be going through this process in a series of steps. Remember, we typically see initiation, elongation, and termination. Um, but activation uh, of the amino acids or ch uh, charging of the tRNAs is important, and also post-translational uh, processing and folding uh, and localizations of proteins is also important. One of the great tools to study um, the process of translation is antibiotics, and antibiotics often can interact with the ribosomal machinery itself, and so you can get some mechanistic insights into um, translation. So let me see if I can make my pointer not go away. Okay. okay, so this is the actual translator, a sky-high view of the translator, so a tRNA molecule. And so you have a codon that's recognized in the messenger RNA, uh, and there's a so-called anticodon that base pairs um, in an anti-parallel fashion uh, with this codon. The tRNA molecule obviously is a very large uh, RNA molecule, and at the three prime end, of this RNA molecule is the position that gets charged with the amino acid. And so through an ester linkage uh, to the carboxylate of each of the 20 amino acids, um, we actually um, activate the tRNA for its role uh, in synthesis of polypeptides. And so we're going to be looking at detail at this. So, but let's first think about the genetic code. So when you think about it, just from first principles, we've only got four nucleotides. So it couldn't possibly be a one-letter code. We have 20 amino acids, not four amino acids. And it really, it's hard to imagine how it could be a two-letter code, because four to the two is only 16. We need 20 different unique combinations to be able to specify all the 20 naturally occurring amino acids. Now, three bases, that would get us in the ballpark, so that would have 64 possible combinations. But, you know, who knows? Nature could have evolved a four-letter code or a five-letter code. So three would probably be sufficient. It's hard to imagine why you would need more. Um, but, you know, so uh, that is one of the areas that was investigated in discovering the genetic code, how many uh, nucleotides are involved in each uh, binding to the tRNA. And then also, well, say... You, if you do have a, a triplet code, then there's two other possibilities. Is that code going to be overlapping or non-overlapping? And it's sort of hard to imagine, well, how could it be overlapping? If it were overlapping, um, you would have this nesting of the codons. And so you would put artificial limitations in the types of polypeptides that could be attached to each other. They would have to mesh with each other. So, for example, here, you know, AUA, that would bind and uh, code for... Uh, 
for addition of one amino acid, but then UAC, ACG. So that was a little bit, I mean, we had to discount that possibility. It seemed uh, unlikely. The other possibility is uh, the non-overlapping code where uh, you need to pick a so-called reading frame. And once you figure out exactly where to start, uh, then you read off amino acid uh, coding codons uh, one at a time in sequence. And so one of the very early experiments that was done to figure out whether it was non-overlapping or overlapping was to make point mutations. And so if it were an overlapping code, if you made a point mutation, um, you would affect the incorporation of multiple amino acids potentially into the polypeptide. Whereas if it were non-overlapping, you would only change potentially the incorporation of a single amino acid. Okay, so th that, that was figured out pretty quickly, that it indeed was a non-overlapping code. But how did we figure out there was a, a triplet code? And so here's this concept of reading frame. If it is non-overlapping, um, where we start the interpretation vastly affects uh, the type of polypeptide we synthesize. So these are, if you look at each of these three reading frames, you have a, a completely different set of, uh, of triplets here. And so uh, we need to have some mechanism to precisely, at the single nucleotide level, figure out where to start reading this frame. Okay, and so uh, here's another way to look at it. So if you look at it in the mean, uh, nucleotide uh, letters, uh, we don't speak nucleotides, but we speak English, at least most of us. And so this reading frame, uh, so here we have a, 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 a a sequence of letters, it's all mixed together. But if we do this particular reading frame, hey, I know what that means, a big red fox ate some eggs, cool. But then if you go into these other reading frames, we, we depart from the land of English into Klingon, heb eager aida fox atet he good. That doesn't make any sense to me. And so this, this sort of, in a silly way, um, gets at the importance of picking the right frame. In only one of these frames will we make sense in terms of the correct polypeptide being synthesized. And so these are the types of experiments. There was, in the 1960s or so, people were figuring this out. Uh, and so people uh, did a series of different experiments. So they, for example, if you just do a one base substitution, they found, as I mentioned before, indeed it's not a non-over, it, it is uh, it is a non-overlapping code because they just changed the incorporation of a single amino acid. You just change one of these codons. But say, what happens if you delete a nucleotide? Well, that shifts the remaining nucleotides to the left, right? Completely throwing the interpretation out of frame. So we have English followed by Klingon. So what if we insert? Same sort of thing happens. We throw it out of frame. We get a completely different set of uh, triplets. Okay, what if we insert and then delete. Well, straddling those two modifications is English. Okay, and so that was helpful uh, to know uh, that you know we could regain frame. It's probably uh, obvious. But then these two experiments really got at whether is it it's a triplet code or a four-letter code, five-letter code. So they did two base insertions, threw it out of frame. But when they did three base insertions straddling those inserted residues, they got, you know, the frame was restored. So the only possible way that this would happen is if it's a triplet code. They could have done this experiment and still maintain Klingon ease after this, and then when they perhaps insert four bases, then if they were able to regain the frame of interpretation, that would tell them it's a four-letter code. And so this experiment told them it's a three-letter code. Okay, so what we know so far, it's a three-letter code, and it's not overlapping, okay? And so here's some of the data they actually collected. So first, they just looked at the uh, molecular association between trinucleotides and radio-labeled tRNAs. And so chemists at that time didn't have all the tools they have today, and they were only able to synthesize uh, trinucleotides of repeating uh, bases, so UEU, AA, and CCC. And so they could put those onto a, a filter paper, and then they put tRNA molecules uh, uh, labeled with a radio label onto there, and they could see, you know, basically which tRNAs bind to which trinucleotide. So that allowed them to interpret some of the code. So we know that if it is a triplet code, that there's 64 possibilities. Four to the three is 64. 
Okay, and so we need to figure out every one of these 64, what is the association between that triplet and a particular amino acid. They continue to do this experiment, but perhaps in a more efficacious way, by uh, doing an in vitro translation system. So they took uh, uh, rabbit reticulocyte lysates, which have all the enzymes necessary to do translation in vitro, and they fed those lysates um, artificially synthesized mRNA molecules. And so there's an enzyme, polynucleotide phosphorylase, that's able to synthesize uh, these types of repeating polymers uh, mRNA molecules, pseudo mRNA molecules. And so, for example, they took poly U, and the polypeptide synthesized when fed to the in vitro translation system was polyphenylalanine. Poly UC, well, they saw serine leucine, serine leucine. Serine, so it's UCU, CUC, UCU, CUC. And the important thing, when they did these experiments, there's no 5' prime cap. There's no uh, necessarily a start codon, so there's no signal to start. So all possible frames are interpreted in this artificial in vitro system. Okay, so the ribosome just happens to start wherever it can. But here it's alternating, it's oscillating, UCU, CUC. So it doesn't really matter where you start. It'll affect like the first um, amino acid incorporated. But in this example, when you have UUC repeating, UUC, 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 where you start the frame determines the homopolymer that you synthesize. So uh, UUC uh, gives polyphenylalanine, so UUC, UUC, UCU, 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 go polyserine, and so forth. Okay, so these are the style of experiments they did, and they can even get more complicated uh, in having four-letter um, repeating units. So this is some of the data from the filter binding assay. What's astounding in this data is the exquisite selectivity that they observe. So UUU completely only bound to the phenylalanine uh, tRNA molecule, and not there wasn't even a drip of uh, cross or cross reactivity with these other inappropriate uh, tRNA molecules. Okay, selectivity was astounding. So again, here's this data. We have poly uh, uh, single uh, nucleotides giving polymers of uh, certain amino acids. And as I mentioned here, we're not correctly picking the frame. So where you start determines which homopolymer polypeptide that you actually make, UUC. So, so for example, in this experiment, they determined that uh, UUC, UUC, UUC um, gave phenylalanine, UCU, UC, UC, UC gave uh, polyserine and uh, leucine. So they've determined these codons. So they're slowly chipping away at the 64 possible combinations of letters to uh, bring in uh, the amino acid specificity. But then they go to this one, and so the graduate student that was doing this said, cool, okay, GUA, there's three reading frames. I've done a bunch of these types of experiments. Of course, I'm going to see uh, three different homopolymers of uh, amino acids. He's like, okay, GUA, codes for valine, AGU, codes for, codes for uh, polyserine, but UAG encoded for poly nothing. Right? So they got in the advisors like, dude, you need to do a better experiment. We all know that you know, we have codons here. Um, but that turns out to be a stop sign. So as soon as the ribosome jumps on in that frame, it just comes off um, because that's the signal. Um, there's three different codons that code for stop codons. Uh, and that was one of them. Okay. So after a while, they put all this together into the book of uh, genetic code, right? So you have a secret code book, and they unraveled the secret. And you really, it's amazing. Like, why did it have to evolve? This particular association of triplets in each amino acids, it seems somewhat stochastic. What you'll see here is there's necessarily degeneracy. So we only have 20 amino acids. We've got 64 possibilities minus 3 stop signs, so that's 61 possibilities. So there's going to be more than one codon in some cases that code for uh, incorporation of a certain amino acid. Okay, so for example, a leucine, there's a total of four uh, codons. And so they began to, the next question is, okay, you know, it's a little beyond our pay grade. Why is it like this? One of the reasons we have, like, lots of codons for leucine is leucine is a pretty frequent amino acid in polypeptides. In polypeptides, you know, whatever have evolved to need leucines a little bit more uh, than other amino acids. But it's always not necessarily understood, and it could have been stochastic. It's like, hey, this works. We just got to have some codon that's associated with each uh, amino acid. 
And so um, you don't have to memorize this every year. Somebody, um, this is a critical point. Don't memorize this. If you need it on an exam, I'll give it to you. I'm cruel, but I'm not like totally evil. I'm just a little bit evil. So, uh, so these are all the codons, and you can begin to see the degeneracy. Other codons or other amino acids just have a single codon, like methionine, AUG. And this is doubling up. It's a green, so red for stop, green for drive fast. Um, and so that means start and incorporate uh, methionine. We'll see how that works in a moment. Okay, so this summarizes the degeneracy. In other words, the number of unique codons associated with each amino acid uh, here in this table. Uh, and so we, we know that there's 61 total, total possibilities for 20 amino acids. Um, but how... So we have tRNAs, and there's very, very specific, this thing, base pairs here. So how could we do this? How could we have six codons for some, some of these? And how could that always associate, be associated with a different uh, tRNA molecule? And what they discovered was fascinating, that there was only, when they started looking at this, at the so-called anti-codon down here, they only found generally about 45, or in the ballpark, of 45 unique anticodons. They said, oh, wait a minute, shouldn't there be 61? So if we had Watson-Crick base pairing, yes, there would have to be 61. And so uh, that, that, that needed to get figured out. That was a remaining uh, confusion. How can there be less anticodons? Because each, we know, every codon is associated with a certain amino acid, so there must be a tRNA uh, that binds there. So let's take this at a little higher resolution. So here we have a uh, green rectangle with shapes on the end. Let's bring this up. Let's put a little bit more resolution. So now we begin to see the secondary structure of the transfer RNA molecule. And you can see up here in the 3 prime end, that's going to make a covalent attach um, through an ester uh, linkage, the 3 prime hydroxyl, with the carboxylate on our amino acid. Okay? And so we have an anticodon codon base pairing anti-parallel, uh, we read the code from 5 prime to 3 prime uh, in this orientation, and, uh, and then we're going to need 3 prime to 5 prime orientation of the tRNA to make the proper uh, base pairing. Uh, so there must be something really magical going on at this interface between the anti-codon and the codon to give us the possibility of only having 45 possible anticodons and still being able to incorporate the right amino acid in all 61 of those possible codons that encode for incorporation of an amino acid. And so here's a little bit more resolution. Uh, so we can always think about Watson-Crick base pairing. We know these are RNA to RNA base pairs, right? So we have A to U, not A to T, and we have G to C. And so it's anti-parallel uh, here. Um, but here's a little hint. It turns out that there's other non-traditional, non-Watson-Crick base pairing that can occur at this uh, five prime position of the anticodon. Uh, so uh, if we have a G or a U there, that can bind uh, to more than one thing in this three prime position of the anticodon. Let's look at that in a little more uh, detail. So this was the conundrum. So Crick, you know, he he did some important things. He figured out DNA and you know, the Nobel Prize. But then he's like, I'm not done, dude. I got more. And then he figured out this. The, he, he noticed this piece of data. He's like, wait, 45 unique, 61 needed. Uh, and so he came up with this wobble hypothesis. And he did this actually by building stick, ball and stick models of this interface between a tRNA molecule uh, and the codon. And he noticed that that last, that five prime position in the anticodon, three prime position in the codon, there was a little bit of a, 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 a geometric contortion there. So he, he, could say, he began to think, okay, maybe we can accommodate some unnatural type of base pairing in that position because the, the, of the uh, geometry of the interface between the codon and the anticodon. And so the, his wobble hypothesis, and then they started noticing, now wait a minute, there's a inosine in this wobble position in the anticodon and in some tRNAs. And as it turns out, inosine uh, can base pair with A, U, or C. And so I think it's hope, uh, helpful to remember which bases base pair with I. So just think AUK. AUK is our AUC. These are the base pairs uh, with I. And so this three uh, prime position in the codon, five prime position in the anticodon was having these non-traditional base pairings. 
Uh, and so I say, okay, let's look at these things. So here's our Watson Crick base pairs, AU. Uh, in GC, remember uh, GC has three hydrogen bonds, AU has two hydrogen bonds, but with inosine, so that's a deaminated uh, adenosine makes an inosine, right? So remove this amino group, you've got a carbonyl group here. So this inosine could have two reasonably good base pairs or hydrogen bonds with C, U, and A. There's a bit of a contortion, there's a usual geometry, the positioning of the ribose here, and these are a little bit uh, contorted, but at that last position, because of the geometry of the interface, we could accommodate this kind of base pairing and make reasonably close to linear hydrogen bonds. And the same kind of contortion can occur here. So we have AU base pairs and GC, but you can also have GU if you have a little bit of flexibility being able to move the U up a little bit. Okay, and so in that um, five prime position of the anticodon, three prime position of the codon, you can have these types of wobble pairing. So happy wobble, welcome wobble. Okay, so the first two, fi uh, fi first two uh, five prime bases of the codon uh, always form strong base pairs. Um, this was by, figured out by uh, structural modeling of this. Uh, and this provides most of the specificity. But this five prime position can wobble. So if the five prime, uh, a position in the anticodon is a C or A. Only one codon could be recognized by that tRNA. Um, if the five prime position is a U or G, you could have the Watson Crick and the non Watson Crick base pairing. But when the five prime position uh, is an I, um, you would have three different codons that could be recognized. Remember, AUC, A U C. Okay? And so here is a more picture, sort of a good summary slide for when you're studying. So we have the Watson-Crick base pairing in the wobble position, a CG, AU. Uh, and then we can begin to wobble, U to A, U to G, uh, G to C, G to U, or I to A, U, or C. Okay. And so this helped us to um, remove or eliminate the requirement that we necessarily had to make 61 unique tRNA molecules. Okay. With one tRNA, if it has an inosine there, that could recognize three of the codons. Okay, you with me so far? I'm sorry if I'm going fast. Okay. So, but then when they, the, the other thing that they figured out is when the amino acid is uh, specified by several different codons, the codons that differ in the first two bases require different tRNAs. So they did a lot of these experiments, and if the, uh, the five prime position in the codon and, and the middle position um, change, if either of those changed, you always had a new tRNA because they're generally very tight. There's no wobbling going on in the five prime position in the uh, codon. But if, uh, if you have, you, but you can have wobbles in the three prime uh, position. But then if you think about it, um, inosine can bind three. To bind the next one, you would need another. So there's, if you just think about two letters, four to the two, 16. And then inosine could cover three of the um, three prime position of the codon. And then you'd have another nucleotide. So it'd be two times 16 would be the minimal number of tRNA molecules. Okay? If every single time you could have an inosine, you did. But that wouldn't work. So if you look at this code, for example, remember inosine would bind to AUC. We cannot put an uh, in a scene here on this tRNA because it spans two different amino acid identities. So say you had a spherogene tRNA with uh, the base pairing with an inosine in the wobble position. Well, then you would get a spherogene with AAA. That wouldn't work. Okay, and so I guess evolution is, is trying to accommodate this necessity to have some in some cases, a correlation between abundance or frequency of amino acids and codon usage, um, you couldn't always use an inosine whenever you could. Here, you could absolutely use an inosine. UAC could be covered by that with uh, leucine. You would need one more here and then one more here because these differ in the first two positions. Okay, with me? This one can wobble, right? AUGU. Okay. So this is sort of the, the types of the, the, the process 
uh, that they use to decode the, the genetic code. Okay. So I think the horse is dead. It beat it to death. Um, let's move on to uh, translation machinery. Now you're going to witness perfection. This is so amazing. So let's look at the players. Let's set the stage. So you have mRNA molecules, tRNA molecules, ribosomes, and then a just amazing assortment of different soluble protein factors that are helping to provide specificity, to provide mechanical forces to push the message along, uh, and to also activate the tRNA molecules. Okay, and so we have initiation factors, elongation factors, and termination factors. So here we're coming in even a little bit more uh, detail to our tRNA molecule. It have, has different uh, arms. These arms have names, the D-arm, T-C arm, the anticodon arm, and what's often referred to as the ACC arm or the amino acid arm. Okay, and so this is an important diagram because it helps you to understand the process of the specificity of the charging or the addition of amino acid to this tRNA. The pink uh, residues are invariant amongst all tRNAs. Okay. So the goal here is to take our tRNA and put only the right amino acid on the right tRNA. Okay. And you can imagine, okay, the enzymes that might do this, they could just sort of reach way down to the bottom, tickle the anticodon and say, okay, I think that's the right one. Or, option B, they have a huge potential surface of interaction with this tRNA at all of these green positions. These green positions are variable. Okay, so different amino acids that need to be added have different surfaces. And so instead of just recognizing three you know, tiny little bases, um, you have all of this large variation here. There's also a lot of um, odd modified nucleotides in tRNA molecules. Uh, so, for example, acai, uh, we, we've see, we saw this uh, last week, that's pseudouridine. Um, the D arm, you might say, why is it D? It looks sort of like a C-ish, oh. Well, that's because it has this uh, modified uh, base, dihydrouridine, and this is the regular uh, uridine. Okay, so the important point here is there's, there's invariant regions, and it makes sense that you would have in varying regions up here because we want to um, form an ester linkage uh, with the adenosine and the factors that are going to help us to add amino acids to polypeptide, we just have one factor. So it's got to have something to latch onto. It's got to be able to predict, oh, this is where the three prime in is. It's an ACC. So that's important to be invariant. Okay, so that's a tRNA molecule, but really it's a misnamed uh, RNA molecule. It should be called an LRNA because it's, it's Secondary, or it's a, uh, I guess you could say secondary structure. It's flat two-dimensional representation is a T. But here in three dimensions, you can see that the D arm and the T psi arm, psi C arm, they were out far away from each other, have now folded up on top of each other. And what this is providing is a large armpit. So here's your body, here's your arm, you've got your amino acid, and the enzymes are going to figure out, okay, I got to put the right amino acid here, they're going to actually snuggle up along this whole surface. And all those variable residues will say, mm, I don't think so. I'm not going to put that amino acid there. So it's important that um, this be in an L shape because that provides the maximal number of potential interactions to provide specificity for charging. Okay, so that's the tRNA. The ribosomes, um, we have differences between bacterial and eukaryotic ribosomes. Um, so they have different large and small subunits, and each of these subunits has different compositions of both non-coding uh, ribosomal RNA as well as proteins. And so, for example, here we have the large subunit bacterial uh, ribosome uh, that has these two ribosomal RNAs and 36 additional proteins. Okay, and here you have one ribosomal RNA and 21 proteins. These are massive. They're 2.7 million Daltons. You got a lot of proteins. You got these RNA, very, very large RNA molecules, and these are coming together uh, during the process of initiation to translate our, our mRNA. Okay, and so the other thing to note is we've, we've introduced this nomenclature here, like so in biochemistry class, 30 plus 50 equals 70, right? That doesn't make any sense because these are actually S means Fedberg sedimentation rate, and the reason that 30 
uh, plus 50 does not equal 80 is because the Svedberg uh, rate has to do not only with the size of the molecule, but its cross-sectional area. And if you take two molecules and put them together, you've, in effect, reduced some of that cross-sectional area from when they were apart. Okay, so if they didn't have this large interface here, they would still have a similar cross-sectional area. And so that nomenclature, so when things get really big, we look at uh, how quickly they sediment in an ultra-centrifuge. And then we have the eukaryotic ribosome. It uh, has its collection of ribosomal RNA, and again, a large number of proteins, and slightly bigger, about 4 million Daltons. Here's the three-dimensional structure of the ribosome that you might see if you walk by Professor Yogel's office. Uh, and so here, uh, the green squiggles and the gray squiggles, those are the actual RNA molecules. And the polypeptides are these sausages. They're like ornaments on a Christmas tree. So back in uh, prehistoric days, maybe 40, 50 years ago, um, people just could not accept that uh, RNA could be a catalyst. And so they were on this mad quest. We've got like 50 proteins I'm going to get a Nobel Prize if I find the one that catalyzes the peptide bond formation. So they went through these one at a time and said, oh, none of them are essential. And when you get this crystal structure, here's three tRNA molecules, one, two, three. And at the interface where polypeptide synthesis is occurring, no squiggles. Like, ooh, okay, what's going on with this? Here we see the message snaking out, and this is a small subunit down here, and a large subunit down up here. Okay, and so these things are coming together and forming uh, the message. And so there's a larger, much larger number of proteins, so I guess it was reasonable to think, okay, there's more possibility that one of those could be important in the catalysis. There's only one piddly or two piddly ribosomal RNAs, okay, so if you just had this table and nothing else, uh, it'd be hard to see things. But then people started looking at the structure of these ribosomal RNAs and said, wow, it's so complex. There's so much structure there. Reminds us sort of of the tertiary structure of a polypeptide. And so the naysayers said, okay, well, that's a very useful scaffold. And, you know, that pr positions the proteins at just the right place. But, you know, uh, RNA molecules, so yeah, may, maybe they could do cleave phosphodiester bonds. They sort of know that chemistry, or they can, uh, they can transfer uh, phosphodiester bonds between two different molecules. So this was, you know, there were still doubters, haters out there. Okay, and so you have this loss of these single proteins. So I mentioned this. They took each one of these 30 proteins away, and it could always still translate, still make polypeptide. Okay. But then they recognize, oh, the 3 prime receptor and the tRNA, remember the position that's charged, obviously that's going to be pretty close to where polypeptide bonds are formed. Well, that interacts with, not with a protein, but with a conserved region of 23S ribosomal RNA. Uh-oh. And then you can, they, they started using antibiotics, and they say, oh, generally those antibiotics uh, are interacting with ribosomal uh, RNA. Ooh, that's not good. Uh, and then they found, okay, I can remove any one of these polypeptides, nothing really happens. If I break a single phosphodiester bond in an inconvenient place within 16S ribosomal RNA, boom, that's it. The thing is completely dead. It's not able to catalyze anymore. Okay, and they also noticed we'll be thinking about something called a shine delgarno sequence. So a particular consensus sequence within 16S ribosomal RNA is very important in setting the frame. So it actually base pairs uh, to the messenger RNA molecule. But then they just said, okay, we got rid of the proteins one at a time. We didn't kill catalysis. Let's get rid of all of them. And then they said, oh, it can still make polypeptides. So that's... Whereas if they removed just one of the ribosomal RNAs, everything didn't work. And then they got the structure, uh, and this is what they saw. Here is uh, the, where all the action is occurring. Actually, this red position is where polypeptides are made. There's no blue squiggles. And so after a very long decades of argument, people said, okay, it is the RNA molecule that catalyzes this reaction.
So let's, let's come back to this thing I mentioned about the setting of the frame. So in prokaryotic but not eukaryotic translation, the frame is set by binding of the messenger RNA um, to the 16S ribosomal RNA uh, here uh, and uh, base pairing. Okay, so here we have the 16S ribosomal RNA, three prime end of that non-coding RNA is base pairing to very close to the five prime end of the message. So uh, this is the untranslated region of the mRNA molecule. And this base pairing, it was noticed that there's a lot of consensus here and here. So as it turns out, AUG is the start site. And the binding of the 16S ribosome RNA gets things exactly calibrated. So we initiate translation just at this position at AUG and not UGG or not GAU. It's precisely positioned by base pairing. So here's a variety of different genes. You could say, that, well, this is not exactly always perfect. Uh, sometimes you have little deviations. Um, but this is the consensus sequence. And so that base pairing is important in setting the frame in prokaryotic. In eukaryotic, it's completely different. Because remember, with prokaryotic uh, transcripts, those are polycystronic. So you necessarily need a mechanism of internal initiation of translation. So a polycystronic message, uh, you have untranslated region, functional gene. Untranslated region, functional gene. So you need to initiate polypeptide synthesis at the, uh, uh, at the five prime end of each of these genes. So the, the positioning of this Scheindel garno sequence allows the ribosome to just drop right into that position. With the initiation of eukaryotic uh, uh, translation, we have a different mechanism where we, the ribosome lands at the five prime cap because all eukaryotic um, transcripts have a five prime cap, and then it scans until it gets to the first AUG start site. Okay, so, and these are monocystronic. There's no need to have internal just ribosomes landing within the transcript, we can scan. We can't scan up here because, you know, we'd have to go through here and the ribosome would fall off at the end because the termination signal also signals the disassembly of the ribosome. So we'd just be making this polypeptide if we had the same mechanism. Okay? Does that make sense? Hardest slide to understand today. How did scientists at MIT in the 60s figure out the direction of synthesis of polypeptides and the direction in which messenger RNA molecules are interpreted. Now, we know messenger RNA molecules are synthesized from the 5' to the 3' prime dire direction, but do ribosomes scan 5' prime to 3' prime or 3' prime to 5'? Prime? Are proteins made C-terminus to N-terminus or N-terminus to C-terminus? This single experiment answered both those questions. So this system, they use the in vitro rabid reticulocyte lysate translation system. They had, they're making uh, hemoglobin, uh, they had an mRNA molecule for hemoglobin, and they had so-called polysomes, in other words, more than one ribosome, was associated with that transcript at the same time, simultaneously and in parallel synthesizing uh, polypeptides. So they let this go for a while in vitro, and then after they had pretty good coverage of the ribosomes across the entire transcript, they uh, pulsed in some radio-labeled leucine attached to leucine tRNAs. So at that moment, and only at that moment, would they begin to incorporate radio-labeled leucines. Okay? And then what they're going to measure is not all of these polypeptides. They're going to measure, they're going to separate the polypeptides that have been fully synthesized. Okay, so when they add their radio labeled leucine, um, you're near the end here. Um, leucine is a pretty frequent amino acid in hemoglobin. That's why they picked it. And so they would just label the very last part that was synthesized. So they look for the label, where it is in the sequence of the polypeptide, and the label tells them what was synthesized last. So in this polypeptide, they would just have the C-terminus labeled. But if they incubate this mixture longer, more of the polysomes terminate trans translation, drop off their polypeptide, and the label creeps to the left. 
Okay, so we know from this experiment definitively that C terminus is synthesized last and that it's and that you know if you give it enough time, this one at the top in 60 minutes can make it all the way through, and then you would have label throughout. So the frequency of leucine, it's maybe about every 10 amino acids is a very long polypeptide. So they had pretty good coverage here. So it's really just a stroke of genius. Densis figured this out. It's the Densis experiment uh, at MIT, and this told us. And this, once they know um, the direction that it's in to see terminus, they could just look at the amino acid sequence, the mRNA sequence, have the book of life, the codons, right? And they can then infer the direction of interpretation of the mRNA. So only in the five prime to the three prime direction did they have the right combination of, uh, that, that corresponded mRNA molecule codons to polypeptide sequence synthesized. Okay. Yes? The red is indicating, and I didn't mention it, I tried to use, you know, telekinesis, that didn't work. The red indicates where the label is. Okay, so at four minutes, the label was only found on the amino acids at the C terminus of the hemoglobin um, polypeptide. Because they, they're, remember, they're only measuring polypeptides that are released. So they have to run all the way off. So at four minutes, you know, this one's not released, it's still translating. This one was released, and they looked at the amino acid sequence, and they found that the radio label was at the C terminus. And so if they give it more time, this is the incubation time with the radio label tRNA, more of these polypeptides, the, the label would sort of drift to the N terminus. Okay, because where the label is, depends on where the ribosome was in this process at the moment you added transfer RNA, the radio label. So they set it up so that it was already a polysome. There were just ribosomes all over the place. Okay. It's, it's just very simple and absolutely answers the question. Okay, I think I'm going to move on. So here is a picture of polysomes. Isn't it amazing? So here you have DNA, and then you have a polysome. You say, uh, Ah, what's going on here? There's co-transcriptional translation. This is DNA, this line up here. And over here, you just have these, uh, uh, the ribosomes. You're basically synthesizing the mRNA transcript, and the ribosomes, are, you're just pushing it through the ribosomes. Right? They're all piling up here. So only in prokaryotes can you have co-transcriptional uh, translation. Because in eukaryotes, translation and transcription occur in different uh, organelles. So we have transcription in the nucleus, translation in the cytosol. Bacteria, there is no nucleus. Ribosomes exist where the transcription is occurring. And so, you know, it's probably not an accident that we're interpreting. We're synthesizing the RNA and interpreting it with ribosomes, both in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. If we were going in opposite directions, we'd have to wait we wouldn't be able to synthesize polypeptides as quickly, okay? Because you'd have to wait for the whole messenger RNA to come in and then go in the opposite direction. But here, um, you could actually have racing. So we'll see in uh, Tuesday's class that ribosomes jump on right away, and if you have a particularly challenging sequence to synthesize uh, through transcription, that the ribosomes can start to affect and interfere um, with uh, the transcription process, and that's actually used in the trip operon. We'll look at that. It's a very, very elegant mechanism that absolutely requires co-transcriptional translation. Okay, so beautiful picture of the polysomes. All right, now we're going to get to um, the actual steps of translation. You've had this before. Perhaps we'll add a little bit more detail, and actually more and more is uh, becoming known about this. So I felt a little uncomfortable with the label they gave to the first stage, activation of amino acids. I think a more appropriate label is charging of tRNA molecules. Converting a carboxylate to an ester, I guess you could, you know, it's, it's, it could be considered activating, but the big picture of what's happening in this first stage is we need to sit, stick amino acids on the three prime hydroxyl of the tRNA molecule, we need to stick the right amino acid. 
So yes, you know, I suppose we're activating, but really we're charging the tRNA. The uncharged tRNA doesn't have the amino acid the charged one does. We have initiation, elongation, termination, and folding and processing. And so we're going to be looking through all these steps. We can come back to this table uh, as we go through this. So step one, the charging of tRNA. And this occurs in two steps by one enzyme. Now, each amino acid has its own amino acylating enzyme. So there's 20 amino acids. There's at least 20 uh, amino acyl synthetases. Okay? This one enzyme, remember armpit, snuggle, um, that one enzyme catalyzes two reactions. And it's important that it's a two-step process. First, it activates uh, the amino acid carboxylate by ampelating it. Okay? So it, it catalyzes this reaction. And in this reaction, that enzyme has to specifically find, okay, I, 20 different amino acyl synthetases, it's got to find the right amino acid. So it's got to have a particular binding affinity for that amino acid. But then in the second step, in a different active site, you have the transfer of the, I guess you could say, activated amino acid to the tRNA molecule, the 3' hydroxyl. So uh, this is a, a phosphoester linkage, right? And now we have formed an ester. So overall, this is the overall reaction, and here's one of the steps, right? So the nucleophilic attack of 3' hydroxyl on this activated uh, amino acid so here's the side chain, labeled R, amino group, alpha carbon. Uh, the carboxylate attached to the alpha carbon uh, is uh, this phospho, I guess you would say, in hydride linkage uh, to our AMP. And so that's going to make an ester. Okay? So we get two chances to check. This is the only time when the translation machinery checks which amino acid is on which tRNA. If we put the wrong amino acid on here, translation will incorporate the wrong amino acid. So we have two-step process where we can check and double-check the identity. We have a nomenclature, the, t the uncharged tRNA without the ester linkage to the amino acid is just called tRNA uh, with a superscript for which amino acid um, its codon recognizes. And when we charge it, we put serine dash tRNA sear. So this Front part indicates that it's charged. There's an ester linkage to the correct amino acid, or it specifies the amino acid that's attached. And this, this part of the name specifies which tRNA molecule we're talking about. Now, obviously, for leucine, tRNA leucine is not just one tRNA molecule. But the cool thing is, is all the different, t or the, I guess there would be minimally three tRNAs for leucine, they all have generally the variable regions of the tRNA molecules are pretty similar, similar yet distinct for that, for that class, for that leucine incorporation. So you could potentially have just one synthetase is recognizing different um, tRNAs that incorporate the same amino acid. Okay, and that's why that variability is important. So we're going to need 20 different distributions of charges and uh, nucleotides within that tRNA to re specifically recognize um, the amino acids in the synthetase. Okay? So this is charging. Um, here's what it looks like after charging. You now have an ester linkage side chain, alpha carbon, amino group on the alpha carbon, carboxylate ester to the 3' prime hydroxyl. Uh, and so it's very important. We need to check and double check here. Um, there's actually two classes of enzymes. Class one's a little... Um, unnecessarily complex. The input and output's the same. Amino acid tRNA coming in, out the backside. Amino acid is in an ester linkage to the three prime position. In this class, it initially starts at the, at the two prime position, then moves to the three prime, um, but that detail is not important. Okay, and so we have different um, amino acyl tRNA synthetases uh, for each incorporation of each of these amino acids. Here's the structure, the two classes are structurally completely unrelated. Uh, one's a dimer, 
and the other is a monomer. This one, the tRNA, sort of does the armpit thing. And so all these interactions are saying, oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. And it puts the right amino acid here at the three prime hydroxyl. Whereas this one, it's actually laying down backwards and it kicks its leg up a bit. Uh, and it's making a different interaction. That gives us more surface. So we only have variability in certain surfaces, right? And so this gives us optimal uh, specificity. So we've charged the correct TNA, tRNA. Now we need to initiate translation. Um, we start with the small subunit. We're doing prokaryotic translation right now. Small 30th subunit has three different binding pockets, E site, P site, and A site. Exit, peptidyl, amino acyl site. And right now, that means almost nothing, but in a moment, it'll mean more. So what we're going to do first is set things up. Obviously, we need to recruit an mRNA molecule. That recruitment is done by that Shine Delgarno base pairing. It's a uh, five prime uh, end of our uh, messenger RNA to the three prime uh, end of the non-coding ribosomal RNA, 16S subunit. Uh, so we've recruited our message, but we also need to block some sites. We want to initiate by just one amino acid coming in here. Okay, and so we're going to block this E site with IF3 and the A site with IF1. And now we have just one site present, and we have a tRNA molecule, and it happens to be a methionine tRNA. And not only a methionine tRNA, but a methionine tRNA that has a in terminal protecting group. So this is just like amazing. It's like what we would do in a peptide synthesizer. Nature has put a formal on the N terminus. You know, formaldehyde, so H carbonyl, is attached to the amino group. And that protects the amino group. Okay? And so now we, we've recruited a tRNA um, for methionine. And our methionine is up here. And this IF2 GTP is checking our work. Only if this base pairing is correct will GTP be hydrolyzed in IF2. Once it's hydrolyzed, there's a conformational change, uh, and IF2 is released. And then that's cement. There's no going back once you've hydrolyzed GTP. But it takes a while. It's sort of like a clock. Only if the binding is very tight will there be enough time for GTP to be hydrolyzed and for this interaction to be locked in space. The second function IF2 is doing is to make sure the tRNA is charged. So when you think about it, here's a gamish. It's a big, like a big cytosol. We've got lots of tRNAs floating around, one of every type. We've got some that have an amino acid, some that don't. So this thing is checking, okay, we want to make sure there's an amino acid there, because if we just put in the tRNA without an amino acid, you're not, going to be able to, you're not going to be able to synthesize a peptide. Okay, so it has two functions, proofreading by the clock set by GTP hydrolysis and checking to make sure that this tRNA has, is indeed charged. So after that is bound, um, that GTP hydrolysis drives the disassociation of all of these uh, initiation factors, IFs, uh, as well as recruitment of the large subunit, the 50S subunit. So this is called the 70S initiation complex. So now we have um, our FMET tRNA, FMET in the P site, A and E site are vacant. Okay. So next, so here's uh, the initiation factors for bacteria. Eukaryotes are a lot more complicated, um, but the same ideas are used with a little bit of elaboration. Okay, so we still have this idea of blocking the sites that we don't want tRNAs to be binding to. Um, but we also have this snaking, scanning mechanism. So we're not just landing the ribosome by base pairing in the right position. We're landing the ribosome on the five prime cap and then snaking the message through until you get to the right um, codon, the, the start codon. So here's a a picture of this. So the message is actually wrapped around. The five prime end is attached. It looks sort of like a plasmid. It's not a covalent plasmid. Um, but you have an mRNA molecule, five prime end, three prime end. Uh, and these are associated with each other. Okay, so you have a five prime cap in eukaryotes, but not prokaryotes. And it turns out you actually do have poly-8 tails a little shorter in prokaryotes, much longer uh, in eukaryotes. And so these are linked together. And then you have here uh, this EIF4F which is made up of these EIF other letters. 
It's like <laughs> confusing. So EIF4F is not another polypeptide. It's the complex of these three. It's like, okay, thanks. That's real easy to remember. And so then now we can see here's the ribosome. So EIF3 uh, has a role in recruiting. This is the small subunit of the ribosome. We're at the five prime cap, and we need to scan through to this AUG. And this is actually, in the last edition of your textbook, there was no figure. Uh, and so now we've learned a lot about how this works. So first, we do the same thing as we did in prokaryotic initiation. We block the E and the A site. But then, before the message comes in, which is different than what we saw before, we recruit uh, this, uh, uh, the initiator uh, tRNA. And this is, for whatever reason, it's not formulated. Okay. Uh, but it is charged, and EIF2 is doing that surveillance role. So here it's just say, okay, I'm going to find the, the methionine. So IF2 does not bind to, like, aspartic acid tRNAs that are charged. It only binds to methionine tRNAs that are charged. And then it brings it into this complex. And then in the next step, we recruit the mRNA that's pre-coded with some of these proteins. And then we're going to literally hold on to the 5 prime end while we snake the message through. And we're going to be scanning because we already have the methionine tRNA in the right position. So we have it here. And we're going to snake the messenger RNA. Do, 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 do. Ooh, there it is. There's our start, our start uh, codon. And that will stop only when it has the correct base pairing. And then when that happens... You get GTP hydrolysis, a similar idea. When that binding is stopped and stable enough, GTP is hydrolyzed, and the whole thing just sort of blows apart, leaving us a minimal ribosome where we have an empty E site and an empty A site. Okay? So we've got this sort of snaking addition, elaboration of the previous method. Okay, elongation is pretty much the same, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, so we're only going to look at prokaryotic. This stage occurs through three steps. The binding of the correct amino acid tRNA to the A site, synthesis of the peptide bond catalyzed by ribosomal non-coding RNA, and translocation of the message by three, three nucleotides. Okay, so here is the first step. So we have the empty A and the E in the A site, and now we figure out, oh, that's why you call it uh, the A site, because that's where the amino acylated tRNA lands. The first amino acylated tRNA is the only tRNA that lands in the P site. Okay? All the others, every amino acid we're going to add, we're going to put in the, T in the A site. So here's our second uh, base pair, and here we have, a, again, a surveillance mechanism. So we have uh, EF elongation factor TU, GTP, binds, doesn't really check the identity of the amino acid. It's, it maybe does, but we don't really have good data on that. But it does make sure that it's charged. Okay? And what's happening here is all the tw possible 20 uh, tRNAs, complex with the EF, TU, GTP, are sampling in this site. So you have potentially like 19 other tRNAs come in there, and they're just sort of coming in and out. When they have the correct base pairing, they stop. And they stop long enough for GTP hydrolysis. And so they're checking this interaction, being very careful, using energy. So this is really just using for specificity. We're, we're spending energy for, to make sure it's the correct polypeptide. So here we have the binding, and when this binds, when GTP is hydrolyzed, the tRNA is like this, and it goes like this. It's like walk like an Egyptian. So here it is pointing out here, and then it switches. And the reason it can do that is this big honking EFTU gets out of the way. So now it's like, oh, oh, hey, here's another amino acid, or an ester-linked amino acid over here. And now these two active sites are directly positioned. So this is important. So if it's the wrong amino acid tRNA coming in here, this is nowhere near this. So even if it samples, as long as it doesn't pivot, we're not going to get the wrong amino acid. So this is sort of a blocking function as well. So now we've got the two amino acids nearby to each other, um, both ester-linked. Okay, and so now we're going to have the amino group uh, and the uh, A site of the second amino acid in this case uh, 
nucleophilic attack on this ester, kick the electrons up, back out. The, the, the uh, figure in your textbook, oh, the shame of the way the electrons are moving. <laughs> I, I, it's just, it, it, don't even look at it. It's just, it, it breaks your heart to see. <laughs> But here you have, it doesn't just kick up, that's a transition state, it kicks out the ester and, and moves over here. So here you have the F met uh, uh, amino acid uh, here and attach a new amide bond formed uh, and uh, this is the amino acid in the second position, here's the side chain, this is a methionine in the first place and now we're at the three prime hydroxyl uh, in, in this A site. But now, to continue, we need to vacate the premises, right? So we need the amino acyl site to get the heck out of the way so another tRNA can come in. And so we have a conveniently shaped, so here's tRNA with the EFTU, and here's this EFG uh, GTP. That thing looks the same, and basically it's like lands without codon specificity, it lands and bumps this thing out of the way. It said, get out of there, it's my spot. And that motion requires GTP hydrolysis. This is not really a proofreading, a checking step. This is a literal movement of this, uh, of the whole, of the whole mRNA and the associated tRNA. So now you have the first tRNA in the E site. We now know why it's called the E site. It's the exit site. And then we have the peptide, the, necess the nascent peptide in the peptidyl site. And we have EFG here. Once its GTP is hydrolyzed, it moves things out of the way, and then it takes off, and now we have a vacant A site. And so we repeat this process for every amino acid incorporated. All right. So elongation, we saw now that it proceeds through three steps. What about uh, termination? Well, in termination, um, you get to that stop codon. Remember, we're sampling all possible uh, tRNAs, so UAG, so we're waiting expectantly for the UAG anticodon uh, tRNA to come in and bind there. It never happens. Instead, there's a, a protein that comes in, a release factor. Again, shaped similarly to a tRNA, except for there's a little extra space up here. There's a little pocket of water that's in here. And so now, when we bind here, it's in the right orientation to stimulate the peptide bond formation activity, but, but we have no amino group here. We don't have a charged amino acid. So instead, we make a new bond to water. There's a little bit of a water pocket. And so now that hydrolyzes off the polypeptide. It drifts away. And then in an active process, we disassemble this. So we use EFG, GTP. Remember, that was um, moving the message along. And that can also have the, the role of sort of pushing uh, this, this apart and disassembling this, uh, this uh, process. There's also this ribosomal release factor. We have a name, but we don't really have much mechanistic detail on that one yet. So that leaves us ready to go. We already have one of our um, initiation factors that's blocking the yeast site. So we're ready to go. Another translation. Okay? So overall, um, we have for each, for the elongation stage, for each amino acid incorporated, we're using five, the hydrolysis of five uh, high energy phosphate bonds. So remember the charging, each tRNA that comes in, we had to use the cleavage of ATTP to AMP, that's two phosphodiester uh, bonds. And then here we had proofreading, and then EFG, GTP is moving the transcript along. Okay. And then we know we had one GTP for, uh, for initiation. Remember, it was bound to our tRNA FMET, uh, the IF2, I want to say. Okay? So here's all the steps that we've seen. We've terminated. Um, and now we can go to the last part. And this is sort of, this gets into the, the, remember the lipid lecture, how painful that was? Just here's this and this and this. There's all kinds of different modifications. You can modify proteins of the N or C terminus. As it turns out, that methionine, almost always cut off as the thing is being translated. Okay, so that methionine, there's a peptidase waiting to cut, because why should we have to have a methionine on the interment? So if you look in genomic databases, you always see a methionine at the first position. It's not there in the polypeptide that's made. It's lopped off. Okay? 
And so we can have whatever amino acids we want. We have to start with methionine because that's the start codon, but then we lop it off. No restrictions on amino acids. We have signal sequences. Well, that's important localization, a variety of modifications, disulfide bonds. We've seen these throughout the semester. Um, this is a summary. We know too much about phosphorylation of alcohol-containing amino acids. Remember, these are changing the charge. You have a nonpolar to a charged residue. Can change shape, change activity, change binding interactions. Carboxylation, uh, here's glutamate being carboxylated, or lysines uh, can be methylated. I mean, this goes on. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of different ways you can slice and dice uh, modifications of these amino acids post-translationally. We've looked a lot at glycosylation, uh, adding uh, glycosyl or uh, polysaccharides to various amino acids. We know this occurs in the ER. It's important in targeting and providing unique epitopes on proteins that are exposed to the surface, the outside environment. We also might, some of you might know that uh, various proteins are lipidated. So RAS, many of you will be clinicians. So RAS is important in cancer. Uh, and so RAS protein can either be in the cytosol or it can be post-translationally lipidated with this cholesterol building block, right? Remember this. It can be lipidated at a cysteine. And that lipid is a nice anchor, which will take the cytosolic RAS and keep it associated with the cellular membrane. Okay, so this is just a lot of different stuff. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So there's lots of antibiotics. So antibiotics are useful for killing organisms and for studying translation. Now, there's some very good reasons to kill organisms. All of you would probably be dead, or a lot of you would be dead, without these antibiotics that specifically target prokaryotes, so bacteria. So when you, you know, were young and you got an infection, you might have had molecules like erythromycin, streptomycin, tetracycline. Um, these are critical, and they have exquisite selectivity for the prokaryotic, prokaryotic versions of the ribosome. Other ones of them are less fortunate. Um, they can be deadly toxins to humans, such as you might have heard of ricin or diphtheria toxin. And so these specifically inhibit eukaryotic translation. But some of them sort of hit both. And you look at this table and say, oh, I have to memorize it. Well, for the subset of you that are going to be clinicians, I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, I'm going to talk about one in detail. So if I were to ask you questions, I might ask you, OK, is it, does it hit eukaryotic or prokaryotic? Are, are there certain antibiotics that hit eukaryotic, prokaryotic? Yes, true, circle T. Um, <laughs> puramycin, I'm going to show you how that works. So then you might want to pay a little bit more attention. So here's puramycin. What does it look like? What does it look like? So a little hint. We've got a peptide in the P site. This pyramycin antibiotic boom, lands in the A site. What does it look like? What is this? Sort of like adenosine-ish, right? Adenosine-ish. It's got this thing. Not adenosine, but it's structurally similar to adenosine. You have a ribose. Remember, this is the three prime in amino acyl site. And then you have, well, not an ester linkage. You've got an amide bond to something amino acid ish, right? A little greasy. So, this thing, obviously, normally what's binding here is a massive tRNA molecule. And at the end is this little um, amino acylation. And so we're mimicking the end. But there's nothing to interact with the codon. There's no anti-codon-codon interaction. So this fits in this active site. And, you know, we can, we're not going to make a, a uh, we are going to make an amide bond. Yeah, so we're going to actually make an amide bond to this. But when we make an amide bond to this, it's not bound by anti-codon-codon interaction. It just goes away. And it prematurely um, releases the polypeptide and actually just sort of stays there and kills the ribosome. It takes a catalyst that could go on and synthesize uh, new polypeptides and completely kills it. All two million Daltons of that molecule now needs to be disassembled. Okay, because it's completely, it's a suicide inhibitor. Okay? So that's pure myosin. You might want to know it. A little bit about that guy.
Okay, so we have protein targeting is important. Uh, we have interminal signal sequences are important for targeting the proteins for export through the ER or uh, bacteria don't have an ER uh, for export out of the plasma membrane. Um, we also have interminal signal sequences uh, for targeting to mitochondria chloroplasts. Other s sequences and signals within polypeptides for localization are internal. So generally the ones that are on the end terminus, once you get to the right location, don't need them anymore. They put artificial constraints on the sequences in the polypeptide. So those are generally cleaved off. The internal targeting sequences are not cleaved off. So proteins targeted in the nucleus have that nuclear localization signal stay within the sequence. So we're going to look at the ER, targeting of ER uh, to the ER. So here you have a highly greasy functionality with a few positive charges. So all proteins that are targeted to the ER, either for export from the cell or incorporation into cellular membranes, have this particular signal sequence. Then what happens is the interaction of, so you begin to synthesize this polypeptide. There's a reason the signal sequence is on the end terminus, because as soon as you start to make that signal sequence, a SRP protein binds that signal sequence, interacts with the ribosome, and says, stop. That's enough. What we're about to make, because generally things that go into the ER are greasy. If we just made those completely in the cytosol, you get all kinds of uh, damaging aggregation of proteins. We want to stop that. As soon as we see that signal, so you can stop and then bind to the ER. So we have an SRP receptor that binds. We snake the nascent polypeptide that's still being translated through a channel, a uh, translocation complex. And this formation of this complex leads to uh, release of the SRP. And as soon as SRP is released, the ribosome says, oh, okay, I'll keep going. And it releases, it, it extrudes like a noodle through this channel, through the ribosome, into the ER. Uh, and then a peptidase, um, not related to the release of SRP, a pepti there are peptidases in the ER that just cleave off these signal sequences because we don't need that. Okay, so this is for, perhaps for export uh, from the cell. We just extrude it in there. For placing uh, proteins in the membrane, I actually added this slide uh, pretty late because I was just curious, how does that happen? So there's both a signal sequence that targets the ER, recognized by SRP, but then there's two additional sequences, a signal anchor sequence and a stop transfer anchor sequence. And so in this, we're not really sort of landing on the ER and extruding our polypeptide into the ER. We bind, associate here, but then we make, we sort of step off a little bit from the ER and make our, a little bit of sequence. And these sequences are recognized by this particular protein. So first you have these two. And when you make the second uh, alpha, obviously these are going to be right charged or uncharged. Uh, hydrophobic amino acids tangentially from the axis. And so when we finish uh, synthesizing this alpha helix, that's a signal to this translocase, dissolve, go away. And when that happens, we, we end up with those two alpha helices in the membrane. We make another two. It's recognized by this binding complex. Um, when it recognizes that second alpha helix, dissolve, go away. And so we're doing these two alpha helices at a time. Um, and we end up with our integral membrane protein. I just thought that was pretty cool. Okay, so if we make proteins, we need to be able to degrade them. I know this lecture is a slog, record number of slides. And so um, many of you know about ubiquination. So ubiquin is a 76 amino acid polypeptide. It's attached uh, through its C terminus to the epsilon amino group of target proteins. Um, so there's an enzyme, series of enzymes, or classes of enzymes, E1, E2, and 3. E1 activates the ubiquitin uh, using ATP hydrolysis. So you attach the ubiquitin to a cysteine in the E1. And then uh, the action, and then E2, you transfer the, e1, the ubiquitin to the E2, again a cysteine. Now E2, the combination of E2 and E3 provides both 
substrate ubiquitin ligase activity and substrate specificity. So we want to ubiquinate the correct proteins. E3 is more specificity, E2 is more of the ligase. And there's all kinds of classes of these. But at the end of the day, your target protein has 76 bizarro amino acids hanging off the epsilon amino group of its amino acids. And so these signals are recognized by the proteasome binds and degrades the protein. So this is a way that we can actively signal the, uh, the turnover of proteins. As it turns out, the amino, remember we cut that methionine off at the end terminus? So we revealed something surprising. And what we revealed is correlated to how long that protein will last in a cell. If we reveal any of these amino acids, that protein will generally last 20 hours. Whereas if we reveal an arginine at the end terminus, that protein is going to be degraded in about two minutes. So there's some, and we're still trying to understand, okay, something's got to be recognizing what's going on at the end terminus, looking for certain amino acids, and then interacting with the ubiquination system to be able to degrade the protein. So protein turnover is an important regulated process. So after the clicker... Um, for those who are geeky, like me, we have the Paul Berg movie on translation, hippie translation. There were no drugs involved in this process. Yes. So we also have a question for the yep. audience. Okay, one quick question, guys. Maybe it's the clicker question. Perhaps. It goes, goes back to the Densis experiment. Yep, the Densis experiment. If uh, amino acids... Maybe I asked a question on the Densis experiment. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. If uh, amino acids at the C-terminus are indicated by the red markings, how does the Densis experiment indicate that the protein is made from N to C-terminus? Because the, in the Densis experiment, the labeling indicates not what was made first, what was made last. So in the Densis experiment, they saw the label first at the C-terminus, and so that was made last, only because the polypeptides that released very quickly were already almost already done with translation before you added the radio label. Okay, so that's a, that's, that's a confusing experiment. Ah! <laughs> I'm hiding. I'm hiding here. You're going to lynch me. It's actually easy.
How are you guys doing? Okay, I'd like to get to our entertainment part of today's lecture. Has everybody voted? A lot of words necessary to convey a very simple meaning here. Okay. Everybody voted? Any more votes coming in? A few more? Click. Click for your lives. Okay. So it's C. All right, we're going to movie time. Who brought popcorn? Oh, you guys got to shut up. In a molecular happiness, you're going to have that opportunity. For this film attempts to portray symbolically, yet in a dynamic and joyful way, one of nature's fundamental processes, the linking together of amino acids to form a protein. We know now that the three-dimensional structure and the function of a protein is determined by the order of amino acids it gets along much the better. of the molecule. <laughs> so protein synthesis involves programming and assembly. And this film, with people portraying molecules, using the dance idiom, tries to animate these two processes, the programming and assembly of a protein. Our genes carry the instructions for ordering the amino acids of each protein. Those instructions are encoded okay, be quiet, in the messenger please. and RNA, depicted in this film mm -hmm. as a long, snaking chain. Each of the message units is played by three adjacent people in the chain. Colored head balloons indicate the bases. Green for guanine, blue for uracil, yellow for adenine. If there is a message, there must be a way to translate that message. And that's the job of the ribosome and of the transfer RNAs. The ribosome is composed of a large and of a small subunit. And these are depicted in the film as tumbling, rolling clusters of body, amorphous by themselves, but organized and structured when in the act of translating the message. First, the small subunit, with the aid of an initiation factor, captures the message. Then, the first transfer RNA, carrying its cognate amino acid, is brought to the ribosome message complex by a second dancing initiation factor. This requires energy, and that's represented by a puff of smoke. Next, the large ribosomal subunit tumbles into place, and then the process of bringing each amino acid to the ribosome message complex is accomplished by the T factor and its GTP cohort. And so, in the order prescribed by the balloon colors in the message chain, each amino acid is brought to the assembly site to be added to the growing chain by the peptidyl synthetase. Next, in an energy requiring step, the message RNA, tRNA complex, is shifted so as to bring the next message unit into the ribosome to allow the process to repeat itself. At the end, the terminator factor, seeing the termination signal, cleaves the completed protein from the last tRNA, releasing it from the ribosome. So that the ribosome can do its job again, the two subunits are split apart and separated from the messenger by the ribosome releasing factor. My diagram is of necessity static, but protein synthesis is a dynamic process. This movie tries to bring those dynamic interactions to life.
Brillig and the slithy 30S ribosome did gyre and gimble in the wave. 30S ribosome. All Mimsy was mRNA, that colored message unit array. MRNA. MRNA. Found they were in the glorious sun by initiator factor one. Initiator factor two. Initiator factor two went searching for tRNA who bore the flaccid amino acid. <laughs> 